This conference will now be recorded.
Good morning to everyone present here. I call uh, I invite Tanajay to start the session. Good morning to all of you. HBD of the department, Dr. M. Sunita, Madam, faculty and dear students, a warm welcome to all the to all our VRS ACM student event chapter guest lecture on pursuing a career in data science. First, I would like to thank Principal Sir Dr. A. V. Ratnaprasad and HBD Ma'am Dr. M. Sunita for giving permission to conduct this event. And I thank to its resource person, Dr. Ebin Deniraj, HWD, Department of CSC, IIIT Kottayam. Thank you so much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Now I would like to introduce today's chief guest, Dr. Ebin Deniraj. Dr. Ebin Deniraj is the head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, faculty in charge, academics, Indian Institute of Information Technology, Kottayam. He did his B.Tech from Cochin University of Science and Technology and M.Tech from VIT University and Ph.D. from VIT University. He is an ACM distinguished speaker and given talks and taken sessions, HTTP trainings at various institutions. He has patents and done projects at prestigious institutes. He has number of international research publications and book chapters. He is professional member of IEEE and Nodal Official for AISHE and Swatch Bharat Summer Internship Program. Now I request a resource person to continue the session. Good morning, yeah. Uh hope i am audible yeah fine so a very warm good morning to uh, all of you and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to uh, this acm chapter and also uh, it's it's really a pleasure to uh, e meet you all uh, today morning and if it was the uh, maybe uh, if it was the normal situation uh, we could have very well had a, a face to face interactive session but unfortunately because of the various uh, situation which is going in and around the world uh, we are not in a position to do that and i also hope that all of you are safe and all your family members are also safe right so uh, before i begin uh, what i am asked to do uh, that is basically uh, giving a talk on uh, data science so i thought i'll, I'll just uh, Talk a few things about uh, my institute, which is uh, IIIT Kottayam. So uh, it's an institu institution of national importance by an act of parliament. So it is situated in the state of uh, Kerala. It is a, a kind of relatively a new institute. When I'm saying relatively new institute, it, it is hardly uh, six or seven years old only. It was established only in the year uh, 2015, and uh, within a short span of time, we have uh, done a lot many things, especially we have uh, MOUs with many prominent IT industries as well as even premier uh, international institutes. And also we have one flagship uh, program for uh, working professionals from industry uh, that is uh, MTech for working professionals in AI and data science. And uh, in that we have uh, industry persons from uh, both product based companies as well as uh, service based companies right? and also our, our most many of our students have done internships as well as got placed in a product based company and also we are in uh, close touch with industry to improve the interface between academia and the industry right so i'll just show you some snaps of the campus so this is how the campus looks like it's a very beautiful campus so uh, if you are interested in in pursuing uh, either uh, mtech or uh, phd you are very well uh, welcome to take a look at our website and maybe uh, go ahead and apply for the courses right now having said that let me uh, move to uh, the the agenda for for today's meeting or today's session uh, so uh, over here uh, what I'm uh, planning to give is it's, it, it won't be a, uh, an in-depth research or a perfect technical talk. I'm trying to give you a, a more of a, a big picture type where uh, I'm, I'm just uh, 
I'm putting forth a question like, uh, are you ready to be future ready? Or in other words, I'll be mentioning a few things uh, about uh, the significance of data science and AI. And obviously that will get connected to the career opportunities in uh, both AI as well as data science, right? So, uh, uh, so obviously we are living in a world where uh, businesses uh, must use data to improve services. That is, if you want to increase productivity, if you want to increase sales, data science has become kind of uh, interwoven in everything we do uh, right now, right? So uh, even if I'm saying, uh, of course, the future is very bright for both AI and data science, uh, the, uh, the, the essential word here that is future, and by extension, um, I mean future technology, right? So uh, data scientists basically use both the normal data as well as big data to forecast all eventual outcomes that could affect an industry. So it's not uh, that both AI and data science are confined to only computer science domain. It is uh, kind of multidisciplinary. So it's, it's true because data science has touched nearly every area, right from healthcare or uh, right from uh, like even the the moment we are speaking right this is getting recorded right so obviously even the analysis of this talk look whatever whatever kind of words i'm using so all these things can be analyzed right so uh so, so as i said it has touched almost every uh, area in our daily lives and uh right from say healthcare where models can anticipate patient outcomes side effects or uh, you think about uh, managing the road traffic where say algorithms can predict peak times and and suggest you when it is the best uh, time to travel uh, during a partic particular time of the day right so we have uh, all of our all of us are used to these kind of technologies and also uh, the the various different uh, use cases right uh, but of course uh, no algorithm or no model is flawless and you can uh, never really forecast a person's behavior without making little adjustments for reality, right? So uh, that is again the significance of data science. So you you cannot have a kind of generalized thing for data science because uh, something which is working perfectly fine in in social network analysis that may not work in uh, in 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 another domain such as logistics. Even though you can represent both things using uh, gr using nodes and edges, but you cannot kind of transfer the same thing to the, this thing so that is the relevance of both ai and data science where most of the time you need to have some uh, specific models to achieve what you intend to achieve right so uh, mostly at the end of the stock you will be definitely able to answer a few questions like what will be technology at the end of 2030 or possibly even a bit further uh, say what will be technology like in uh, 2050 right so uh, this talk will be all about the career in uh, data science or uh, I can say AI analytics or the different dimensions of data science, what you have all been hearing and listening, uh, uh, like a lot of jargons like right, around data science and to uh, break, you know, the, the myth or maybe the doubt what we have got because there are a lot of individuals who have been coming to us, like even as part of the MTech program or as uh, I mean UG students, a lot of individuals have been uh, coming and asking like uh, that, uh, say uh, uh, particularly, I'm from a different background and some of them, they say even from commerce background or some of them from engineering background like mechanical or electrical. But uh, data science, it's one of the most booming segment and also the one of the booming sector. So this question always, uh, hit everybody's mind whether uh, am i the best fit for uh, for this particular program or uh, for a domain in, or for a career in data science and what skill set should i have uh, or uh, how should i upgrade myself so that industries will pick me up with open hands or uh, welcome me with open hand in a career of of data science right so uh I'll start ahead. I mean, I'll start with something like uh, something related to AI in action. So uh, this is one of the visible uh, aspects of AI. Uh, you know, the part of AI today that is very popular, that is machine learning. So these photographs, what you can see right now on the screen, uh, 
uh, one thing which is common across all these photographs is that none of them are of real people okay i repeat none of them are of real people they were created by computer based on a uh, say description or a broad description given to the computer which of course has been trained on certain data related to human beings and uh, on one hand there is training of data and on the other hand there is you know uh, a brief description of what i'm looking for and the computer is able to generate these uh, photographs uh, so if you are taking a look at these photographs right from 2014 to 2020 uh, you see that it, it is a it was a bit grainy uh, right in 2014 and as the years evolved that fuzziness actually kind of it was eliminated and the images became more and more sharp so but that's itself you can be very clear how AI have or data science have progressed within the last six seven years right so uh, so uh, to, to tell more about the underlying technology it is something called the generative adversarial networks if you want to know more about it you can very well google it but and it is uh, very much used as part of image manipulation you know uh, enhancement of image quality and uh, also uh, maybe as, as we proceed i'll be able to give you more glimpse of uh, what ai and ml is capable of uh, today right so this picture basically demonstrates the generation of uh, realistic photographs of uh, human faces they are so real looking in fact it is fair to call the result as a remarkable and uh, this particular thing you, you have given the source as well this has got a lot of media attention also and you might be very well be uh, aware of apps uh, whether it is android apps or uh, ios apps which are known by the name face app right so you, you click a selfie of yours and it will tell you how you're going to look in your old age say 70 years after 70 years how you're going to look right or if you so all these kind of things it has made or it is it, it is possible with the uh, help of this uh, ai or or this data science right so uh, whenever we say that a particular domain has a lot of opportunities obviously uh, we all learn and study ultimately to get a job right so the the scope of a job it is actually determined by that particular demand and most of the time it should has that particular uh, hype or it should have that requirement in the industry right so why exactly data analytics has uh, suddenly become popular right so if you are uh, think uh, traversing back say 20 years back every office you go you can find something called a typewriter so but now you can't find a typewriter in any of the offices right so uh, that has that is a change that has happened in the last uh, 20 25 years right so to champion this data literacy there is a need to teach a data as a second language to enable this data driven businesses so uh, imagine that an organization they want to uh, pursue this data science or they want to make this data driven business but assume that uh, there is no coordination between the various departments let's assume that uh, within an organization let's assume the marketing department is speaking french and the product designers are speaking german and the analytics team uh, they are speaking spanish and uh, obviously what will happen is it will create utter confusion so even if the organization is uh, was designed with digital in mind communicating uh, business value and why specific technologies matter that would be impo impossible unless and until you think on the same thought process or unless and until you align yourself as a team so that's essentially essentially how a, a data driven business functions when there is uh, no data literacy that is the, the the previous example which i said like each department is kind of compartmentized and they will be within on their own uh, departments right so obviously if no one outside this department understand what is being said it doesn't matter if data and analytics offers immense business value and uh, of course it is a required requirement of a component of a digital business but still it may not make uh, much success right so uh, there was a, a survey which was conducted and it was said that by 2021 50 percentage of organization will lack sufficient ai and data literacy skills to achieve this data driven business value so that is the relevance or the prevalence of uh, data analytics capabilities right so 
uh, as uh, data analytics become core part of a digital business uh, data almost becomes an organizational asset so employees must have the least or basic ability to communicate understand conversations about data so in short this ability to speak data will become an integral uh, aspect of uh, most day to day jobs so that is the significance of data analytics so uh, maybe 20 years back or 10 15 years back people who know how to use a computer they had an edge so you call that as maybe you can call it as digital literacy or computer literacy maybe the next two decades or the next 20 years it's it's all going to be about analytics literacy people who can understand data who people who can who are literate in data analytics they'll have a lot of scope and they'll have a lot of uh, potential to excel in their career so on what basis are we saying this like uh, saying that okay by this year you have a lot of significance or by in in another 10 years you have a lot of scope in this particular area right so there are scientific study which are being conducted so one such scientific study is actually conducted by a by an organization called the gartner so every year maybe for the past 15 years they are releasing something called the hype cycle or to in order to uh, graphically represent the life cycle stages of a technology right from its uh, inception to its maturity and to its uh, widespread adoption right so this hype cycle is very critical in in determining uh, what exactly is happening with the technology right so if you if you if you could notice here just give me a second so if you could notice here, I have something called a technology trigger over here, right? So a technology trigger is actually a, a potential or, or a potential technology breakthrough which kicked off. And uh, let's assume you have the early proof of concept uh, available for that particular technology. But uh, as, as in this stage, there is no usable products exist and the commercial viability is kind of unproven at this stage. Right? So which means that you some companies may have some internal project and they have some some prototype which are which are kind of internal to them so that is a point where you call it as technology trigger right and then you have this uh, peak of inflated expectations so what happens with this uh, peak of inflated expectation uh, is that uh, that the technology is, is kind of implemented uh, and especially by the early adopters that is maybe a company would have uh, given some uh some white paper regarding this particular technology saying that this is uh, this has got a lot of scope right so there'll be a lot of publicity about both successful and un unsuccessful implementations of uh, this thing right and uh some companies may be pursuing this and some companies may not be pursuing it and then so, so this area you have a lot of media attention you have everywhere you have this ai or you have this that technology being heard wherever you you look you will have a lot of media attention right now after that what happens is uh, people realize maybe it may not be that much useful it is it, it is going to be okay a little bit useful not that much useful so then you have this trough of disillusionment right so maybe flaws and failures may lead to some disappointment of that particular technology and some maybe companies are unsuccessful uh, to or to or they they may drop their products whatever they uh, they plant right so uh, ultimately uh, that hype actually it comes down right so uh, they may have a, a kind of fear factor whether this may fail after investing this much of money so this is known as the the trough of disillusionment right so uh, the investment continues only if the surviving providers improve their products to the satisfaction of these early adopters so that portion is actually this slight slope of enlightenment so this is where companies test it in their environment and they realize that uh, this can create further generation of products and this is going to be definitely useful to the common man right so maybe you have second and third generation products which appear in the in the pipeline and people started uh, uh, realizing hey this is uh, really good and finally, coming on to this one, you have this plateau of productivity where uh, you have a scenario where this technology is widely implemented and its place in the market and its applications are well understood. So uh, even a common man may start using this product. It is at that point you say that, hey, uh, the product is successful and it has reached its maturity level, right? 
So Gartner has been releasing this kind of hype cycle every year for emerging technologies. So uh, just to uh, make you understand the significance of this uh, Gartner hype cycle, if I'm showing you uh, the hype cycle of year 2010, whatever we are using, which has become common part of our life, that was actually mentioned 10 years back or 11 years back, right? You can see here the 4G standard. Now we know that everyone has a smartphone with a, with a 4G connection, right? It has become a common thing, right? And if you, if you think about speech recognition, right? Everybody right now use uh, this, any sort of conversational uh, assistant, like uh, whether it is uh, Alexa in case of Amazon, or whether it is Siri in the case of uh, iPhones, or whether it is uh, say, okay, Google in the case of uh, Android phones, right? So all these things, uh, it has reached this plate of productivity, right? So that is the significance of uh, these hype cycles. So every year they release this kind of hype cycle. And it's very interesting to note that for the past uh, three, four years, they are actually releasing something called a hype cycle for AI. So earlier they were releasing it for emerging technologies, but now they realize that uh, uh, the, uh, the AI as such cannot be kind of compartmentized or cannot be confined to uh, like to the list of emerging technology. That itself is a very big domain. So they realized that and they started giving this hype cycle uh, specifically for AI, right? So uh, if you are again talking about certain statistics, uh, between 2018 and 2019, uh, organizations that deployed AI, they grew from a figure of 4% to 14% according to this Gartner survey, right? So definitely AI is reaching organization in many different ways compared to what we were seeing a few years uh, before, right? So uh, maybe since this is a old hype cycle, what I'm gonna do is I'll just uh, talk about the new one. Let just, uh, I'll, I'll just go to the, yeah. So if you look at this, this particular uh, hype cycle, you have a lot of uh, AI related technologies over here. So at least you would have heard and maybe you would have studied some of these technologies, especially if you, if you think about uh, normal artificial intelligence, I'm sure uh, in your UGS or, or in your PG curriculum, definitely you will have uh, this particular uh, course being offered, right? So other than that, you have a lot of other upcoming technologies. Say, for example, if you are talking about embedded AI, so you, you have a lot of efforts which, which is being taken by top companies to place supercomputers in your pockets, right? So edge computing systems have uh, kind of uh, uh, got so much of uh, attention in the last uh, two to three years. So as we uh, approach an era of say IoT or this uh, 5G, uh, and you have these portable devices, which is uh, heavily being used, it's crucial to facilitate developers and develop uh, edge applications quickly. So uh, that's the significance of this embedded AI. And uh, so if you're talking about other things, let's say about a, a generative uh, AI or uh, to be specifically generative adversarial networks. So this was one of the use case which I showed in the, in the first slide. You have these photographs which are which is being generated completely by a computer, right? So uh, AI can uh, do these things and also especially this generative adversarial networks. It is considered to be one of the critical turning points in the history of machine learning. So uh, this generative adversarial uh, uh, networks, it is right now in the year 2020, it is in that part where you have this innovation trigger, like you don't have a, any products which or any product which a common can common man can use, it hasn't been uh, yet formed with this generative AI. But still, researchers and sp people who are specifically working on that domain definitely uh, they'll be able to know more about the generative uh, adversarial networks applications, right? So, but at the same time, the the proliferation of uh, generative networks. Uh, has had uh, many unwanted results also uh, because you can uh, think about uh, say many malicious uh, online users can now generate disinformation in the form of images and videos and they can easily fool people right so generative networks are are all fun and games until they start interfering with matters of national interest for good or for worse, these networks are here to stay for a while. That is at least for the next uh, 
uh, five to ten years the generative adversarial networks are going to stay here and uh, the uh, another significant thing is responsible and explainable ai so most of the time uh, we we may be uh, working on some ai technology and sometimes it's very difficult to kind of uh, explain why something is happening right so especially in the in the medical domain if you are building a, a model for a particular uh, use case in the medical domain uh, so sometimes you will be surprised why something is happening and why not the other way around right so be it medical diagnosis or uh, whether it is a credit card risk estimation the amount of personal information that is processed can be very sensitive and this is being uh, addressed in the organizations which are uh, serious about the implementation of explainability so especially uh, in developed countries especially if you take about united states and all uh, if a company is doing something clearly they need to mention how exactly they are doing that so uh, that's the significance of privacy and explainability in that context even in india things are changing now uh, for for a uh, for a good reason and but let's uh, we need to uh, wait and see how it is going to move forward right so similarly you have uh, uh, i'm not explaining uh, all these things so uh, as you can see there are a lot of uh, significant uh, things which are happening uh, right now in in ai right so uh, uh, i know that it's been quite some time you have been uh, staring at the screen so uh, you will will take a short one minute power break just move your eyes away from the screen and what we were talking till now was all about gartner hype cycle which will uh, which is actually the pointer which says that there is a lot of significance and there is a lot of uh, scope uh, in pursuing a career in in data science right so just move your eyes away from the screen and we'll come back in another uh, say 30 seconds Okay, so uh, what we were uh, discussing right now was uh, you have a lot of future in data science and also uh, there are various surveys which predicts that there is going to be a severe shortage of at least uh, two to three lakh data scientists in, in United States alone over the next uh, decade. Right? So uh, it, definitely, uh, although automated tools and, uh, and assistance uh, can help in human mind to to decide a task more quickly and accurately technology will never uh, replace human thought so intellectual thinking is at the heart of problem solving and no computer no matter how advanced can imitate it so that's why i'm saying like uh, there's a lot of scope in in this data science right and also uh, when i was uh, looking through the uh, through this particular uh, talks brochure uh, I've seen that you have a ACM women in computing uh, chapter as well. So I thought I'll just show a few of the significant women scientists which were uh, kind of active in the field of computing. So uh, this is actually um, IBM's first uh, female vice president, uh, Ruth Leach, and she was the vice president in the year 1943. And if you think about uh, uh, this one, it's lady ada lovelace who is the first women programmer right and uh if you think about this one or uh, even acm has uh, set up so many different awards in the name of admiral uh, grace murray hopper and she popularized the idea of machine independent programming languages which led to the development of something called the cobol which uh, maybe um, you might have you might you wouldn't have studied it but when uh, during my school days cobol was one of the significant language which had a lot of uh, lot of fans right so it's a kind of an early high level programming language which is still used in certain use cases even today right so that is the significance of acm women in computing but unfortunately research indicates that data science is a very promising career path and it's a 
speed likely to offer job security and growth for uh, the next few decades women are still significantly uh, underrepresented in in data science so uh, statistics across multiple studies confirm females uh, fill about only 15 percentage of data scientist role although uh, like there are a lot of opportunities available out there yeah so and also if you think about the women uh, in uh, ai researchers it's hardly 10 to 11 percentage right so but there are a, a lot of good initiatives to encourage women to participate more in that and one such thing is global women in data science which is wids which is a, a prestigious conference or event which is held every year and it had uh, like around close to 200 events every year which is conducted by this uh, global women in data science right so uh, ultimately uh, things are improving and let's uh, i just wanted to make it a point so that uh, like uh, the, the female representation in these uh, things can uh, improve in the years to come right and also it's also an excellent sign that uh, universities and education institutions are offering data science programs as well as degrees uh, to uh, to kind of get a more balanced uh, gender representation uh, for a better uh, tomorrow right so so if you if you are thinking about data science whether it had come just suddenly out of the blue and just conquer the market unfortunately it is no right data science if you think about it's like this beautiful picture uh, it's it's it looks very good right but if i'm saying earlier the same place was looking in this sort right and from that position it has uh, reached to a point of this so the journey was not a, a smooth journey so right from the early days of uh, scratching uh, numbers up to the or uh, to the to the days of punching of numbers into a key uh, in, into some punch cards so data science has come a long way so the the technology may have changed the methods may also have changed but uh, what hasn't changed going as uh, far back as the past industrial revolution in the 19th and 20th centuries or uh, maybe going uh, 200 300 years back so uh, what what is that is that uh, even in this thing also mathematicians and statisticians are, are actually playing a, a critical role in this particular domain of data science so data science in the form which we know it today has been uh, only around since the new millennium that is hardly 20 years old right so when uh, statisticians who felt that they had unique set of skills uh, they chose to separate themselves from the traditional mathematicians and computer scientists and uh, that's how it all started so the uh, so despite the term existing for the century it has been already labeled multiple times as the and of sexiest job in the 21st century which uh, understandably has created a, a lot of uh, repercussion in the in the technical technical world right so and that is also the reason why now universities as well as uh, everybody wants to organize something related to data science or ai right so just to show you a few glimpses of how exactly it has evolved it all started with analytics 1.0 which was more Family, uh, more commonly known as business intelligence where you had this uh, data warehouse where customer and all these transactions were uh, piled up in the form of a table right and that was in the beginning of 2012 and later so using this you were able to deal only with structured data which means that you had a row and a column and easily you can pull out the data whichever you want and you can analyze the data in whichever way you want right now moving ahead uh, for 2000 uh, to 2014 that was the era of or that was the dawn of uh, big data so uh, so this is a, a more prominent era where because most of the prominent companies they stepped out of their kind of comfort zone and began their pursuit of a wider or better approach in attaining a sophisticated uh, or in in achieving a sophisticated form of analytics so uh, the the reaction from customer side was uh, was very well and uh, also this has started creating a lot of data and by, when it was 2016 it has moved on to analytics 3.0 where you have data enriched offering like uh, companies who doesn't 
uh, have this data driven pattern it's very difficult to survive in in this today's world right so it, it has become kind of rooted in 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 uh, analytics right and right now we are going through something called the analytics 4.0 even though i have mentioned it here uh, but right now it is the era of analytics 4.0 where you have this uh, automated capabilities so there have been always uh, four types of analytics usually you call it descriptive which uh, reports about the past right and then you have this diagnostic uh, which uh, uses the data of the past to study the present right and then you have the predictive analytics so which uses insights based on the past data to predict the future right and also there is another aspect called the prescriptive so which uses models uh, to specify uh, optimal behaviors and actions right so uh, right now we are in this era of automated analytics right so uh, if if you th think about this is how it has uh, evolved over the years right and also the the particular uh, evolution of computing that has also played a huge role so if you think about the year 2020 2020 has been a year of disruption so uh, uh, or in other words i can say that disruption is the hallmark of the year 2020 so a lot of things has changed and we never thought that in our lifetime such a kind of scenario is going to happen so usually in in economics there is a theorem called black swan theory something which is uh, which you are never gonna uh, which something which you expected never gonna happen but it has happened and it is now actually controlling each and every aspect in your economy right now so that is known as a black swan theory so so uh, right now definitely that is a kind of scenario we have but definitely this evolution of computing has actually helped a lot in achieving uh, or in in maintaining uh, certain things without uh, getting much affected so cloud computing is one such thing where uh, even companies who were earlier hesitant to move to cloud they were uh, forced to move to cloud because of the pandemic situation so what would have happened uh, or or a kind of digital disruption that would have happened over a 5 to 10 years has happened in a very small uh, sm small uh, time gap of say one and a half years right so this kind of technology evolutions as well as uh say let's say certain things have become a lot more cheaper right so if you think about the year 2009 and all if you want to get one terabyte hard disk not many people could afford it but right but right now you can get a one terabyte hard disk maybe if you spend 2000 to 2500 easily you will get or even less than that i'm not quite sure about that but still it is uh, affordable to even a common man and also there are a lot of uh significant frameworks that can help in uh doing these things so for example imagine about uh, the the technique technology of deep learning deep learning is not something new the deep learning was kind of proposed in early 1980s but right now we have the right kind of hardware and also the right kind of frameworks to actually easily implement that deep learning framework right so all this has kind of uh, uh helped in uh, uh setting up a, a wonderful stage for data science and ai to excel right so if you think about what is happening in one minute of a day in the year 2019 if you if you observe here uh, uh you have these many uh say these many users using the uh, next team these many tweets are being made right these many people are making a skype call right so a lot of uh, things are happening but in 2020 you have a lot of new things zoom right we have never heard of this zoom before 2000 before the pandemic situation or maybe not many would have heard about zoom before the pandemic situation right so but here you have uh, zoom playing a significant role in in 2020 facebook the number of photos uploaded by users in one minute right all this is happening in one minute so you have a scenario where huge quantity of data which are being uh, consumed as well as which are being generated by the users or by the customers right so all this has uh, given a scenario where you can confidently say that data is the new currency or sometimes we also say data is the new oil right so why we say this is actually all about let's assume or maybe some of you might be knowing this or most of you might be knowing how does companies like 
uh, facebook or uh, gmail or uh, whatsapp these people how how are they making money right it's all with with the data because here we are the consumers of data and also we are the creators of data because uh, basically uh, whatever uh, we do every day right from the moment we uh, wake up to the time we sleep we are using this this particular device right so uh, ultimately maybe if you think about uh, say some three four years back we were perfectly happy with 600 or 700 mb of data in one month right and then here comes reliance geo and now even 2 gb of data per day is not sufficient for us so that's how we have changed all of us has changed in consuming as well as in generating this data so ultimately this is uh, all it comes to so if you are not paying for something then ultimately just understand that you are the product so there are a lot of proofs for even this so if you think this is a times investigation which reveals that uh, facebook continue to give uh, this huge uh, tech companies like amazon or microsoft uh, the access to uh, access to personal details of hundreds of millions of people around the world so including email addresses and phone numbers so without users knowledge or consent right so uh, ultimately uh, this data can be used to decide your business strategy or this can be used to decide uh, which product should be launched at this point so that i can get maximum profit right so uh, you can have multiple such schemes uh, available which which is clearly tells uh, we want your data so that we can survive right so one such example is so for example amazon shopper so this was a uh, this was released in october 2020 during the pandemic times so amazon quietly announced that it would roll out a new program where it would pay customers for their sh shopping data so uh, at least some of you might be thinking why they should pay for the shopping data so this is known as uh, amazon shopper panel so as part of this program amazon customers would send in their itemized receipts from non amazon suppliers for example you go to a small uh, gro grocery shop near to your home you got some uh, some receipts or voucher from there just click a snap of that and uh, upload it to uh, amazon and then you will receive a credit from the company in return or just all through and through us uh, through a application in the phone right so again uh, let me tell you this was uh, available only in the united states for some some period right and it was a kind of trial run so obviously in all these things it is pointing to the fact that they thrive on this data right so there are other examples such as google reward or google opinion rewards right so where they will give a survey you just fill it up and they'll give some money in in return for that right or if you think about google maps if you are you can give comments and you can contribute to the maps and you have certain levels just like a game and once you cross a level they will be sending you goodies like t-shirt or something so that you keep doing that so it's all a, a game plan where it will make you to uh, kind of generate more data which can actually uh help in uh, uh, them gaining more uh say more leverage out of this data right so this is the reason why it is said personal data is actually the new oil of the internet and the new currency of this digital world and specifically this is not something which is confined to uh, just a domain like uh, like computer science it is <clears throat> it can be uh, or it is being used in multiple domains and multidisciplinary research uh, is being actually kind of promoted a lot uh, with this uh, with this huge quantity of data so that's the reason why i'm saying it's not just confined to just computer science it is all over the place and you have uh, people even from uh, domains that you never think that uh, where you can apply data science even they are making use of uh, data science so in another few slides i'll be mentioning a uh, <clears throat> few such uh, use cases where companies which are non technical how they uh, leverage data science and uh, gained lot or gained lot of profit out of that right so <clears throat> so with this huge data one aspect is it has become too big to handle right so as i mentioned in one minute how much data is being generated so you can imagine uh, in a single day how much quantity of data is being uh, being consumed and also being generated right so to analyze this huge quantity of data it is a herculean task and 
that is another another reason which points to the significance of a career in data science you have lot of uh, options to 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 pursue in this in this particular thing right so these are some of the mega trends that are uh, in the data landscape you have lot of volume and variety you have lot of data being consumed you have uh, uh, you have something called a uh, uh, data streaming where continuously you are being pumped with data and not a batch data right and you have uh, uh, a lot of innovation which is happening on uh, on on capturing this data and processing it in in a very fast way right so if you uh, think about uh, one such application there are certain applications which can do uh, which can give real time subtitles so right now whatever i am talking it can just uh, just show you show the type subtitles in that instant itself right so these are the applications of uh, streaming data analysis right so uh, ultimately in a nutshell i can say that there is a huge demand very huge demand for data driven insights right so to mention few things so uh, that's what i was saying uh, i'll just say few things about companies that are completely non technical in nature but they have leveraged data and they excelled uh, in multitudes uh, because of this data science application right so one such thing is uh, chevron it's primarily an oil and gas company and what they have done is uh, they made use of real time uh, data uh, to kind of improve that oil drilling efficiency and thus re reducing the failure so <clears throat> this is really interesting and also uh, say let's say amazon amazon uh if you say uh, you would have uh, heard about something like uh, amazon go so where you can walk into the, that amazon shop uh and there will be no uh, staff in that amazon shop you can just take whatever you want and automatically the money will be uh, debited from your your credit card so if you want to watch that video you can just type amazon go and those videos are really interesting and if you think about another thing like progressive progressive is actually a uh an, an auto insurance company where uh, uh where uh, it actually gives or suggest uh price uh, based on the driving behavior so if you are a very good driver then you may get a better insurance but if you are a very bad driver you may get a uh, less amount in insurance so, so this has actually kind of revolutionized uh, the the complete industry right and if you think about humana that is also another health insurance company which is making use of predictive uh, analytics and also increasing their profit right and if you think about uh, walt disney <coughs> disney and uh, this is a, a very uh, a significant uh, application where disney in their amusement park uh, they made use of this data science for hospitality management so what they have done is they track customers in amusement parks to optimize the square footage usage so you so to just to avoid overcrowding right and uh, if you think about walmart walmart optimize revenue per square foot by giving their partners uh, the real time insights like where you can keep these things so that you can uh, space efficiently i mean efficiently utilize the space right and netflix uh, i hope you already know that it may it gives you suggestions and also it optimize investments in content creation right and uh, one of the uh, uh, best thing is actually about nike nike maybe 10 years back it was just a normal uh, company which was selling sports goods right but now it has revolutionized uh, itself in such a way that even the uh, health watches what you are uh, getting some of the very good uh, health bands or fitness bands are are made by nike so especially to track athlete activity and to provide a real time user feedback right so i guess it's it's time to uh, take uh, one short break just to just move away i mean move your eyes away from the screen and think about what kind of huge data is coming in your way and what can you do with it or what kind of analysis can be done using that
Okay. So uh, ultimately, when you talk about data analytics, it's all about uh, turning data into value. Right? So I'm not going to explain uh, these things in detail. I, I'm just trying to give you an overview. Right? So uh, we know that uh, usually you have data, then you have uh, information, which is an organized or structured data. And basically, uh, that information, you need to convert it into a sort of insights, right? So uh, usually knowledge is defined with reference to information having been processed, uh, organized, or structured in some way, or as being applied or put into action. So uh, this insight, uh, it, it's actually uh, becomes knowledge or uh, when you do synthesis of uh, multiple sources of information over time, and the organization and processing to convey some sort of understanding right so ultimately uh, these insights will help you in giving some recommendation on a particular problem which you are working and that can convert it into a sort of action so it can be a business strategy where you recommend something and it, it is being implemented and that becomes a success story right so uh, uh, i've been talking about data science for quite some time so most of the time uh, without uh the 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 drew conway diagram a uh, data science talk is not complete right so uh, this is where uh, this is actually the the, uh, the real takeaway from uh, from data science uh, that is how to become a data scientist so what all what all is required to to make a data scientist right so in that aspect the one of the uh, prerequisite which are required is, as I mentioned earlier, you should have a strong uh, maths background, as you can see here. And in addition to that, you should have uh, good programming skills. But instead of programming, it is written here hacking. The reason is you should have that passion for programming so that you should be able to kind of experiment with, with programs and also to, you should have that craving to, to find out new things. Right? So that kind of capability, if you have, then uh, you can definitely work in machine learning and in addition to that if you have the the particular domain knowledge required uh, or domain knowledge of a particular problem say for example uh, if you are given a certain uh, medical problem and you are asked to work on this particular medical problem right and what happens is uh, i say you're not from a medical background so you don't know anything about that particular domain right so but just assume that a doctor who knows programming and who knows maths and who has significant subject subject expertise he can do a lot of things in that particular thing so he can become a better data scientist right so that is the reason why i'm saying like it, this is not something just confined to uh, computer science alone it is something which is universal and it's also interesting to know to add some of the best programmers in the world they are not from computing science background they are, they might be from a different background Right. So ultimately, without programming, as a UG student, if you are if you are uh, trying to become a data scientist, without programming, it is almost Im impossible. Right. And also, data science is not something which is bound only to big companies. Uh, it is also used by startups as well as the middle middle companies. For example, the critical or the a typical use case or typical example of a, a startup who made use of data science is actually Uber. What is actually Uber? They don't own any cars. They don't own any infrastructure. They only have that interface, but their value is in billions, right? So basically, um, they don't own any drivers, and also, like with minimum investment, they are getting maximum profit, right? Or, uh, also, if you um, think about this, coding is unavoidable if you are uh, wishing or if you are want to work in in data science you need to be able to write code so that you can uh, instruct the computer what exactly to be manipulated what exactly would be analyzed or what exactly to be visualized uh, in or using your data so programming languages such as python or r they are very important for writing scripts for these data manipulation analysis and uh, visualization so uh, usually i say uh, as long as you have a curious mind fluency in analytics and the ability to communicate you can definitely become a data scientist so just to show you the significance of uh, uh, this data science as such i'll also share you one particular 
uh, one particular instance where because of the lack of data analytics team how a company uh, kind of doomed itself so if you think everybody uh, would know nokia because that was the kind of premium phone maybe 15 20 years back so uh, to be specific in as of october 1998 uh, nokia was the best selling mobile phone brand in the world so at that time nokia's uh, operating profit was around dollar 1 billion and almost uh, by 2000 it was close to 4 billion so the best selling mobile phone of all time the nokia 1100 uh, it was actually created in the year 2003 right and in 2007 uh, apple they introduced their iphone and by the end of 2007 half of all smartphones sold in the world were nokia while apple iphone had a very meager 5 percentage of the global market so when nokia was the superstar uh, of this uh, mobile phone industry but the, their simba and os the company failed to see the obvious shift of interest in customers towards the smartphone they took a decision that no we will not release uh, android phones we will go with our simba and os and we'll market that and we'll make that as popular as possible so that was the reason one of the reason for this failure of this kind of a company right so when explaining nokia's uh, failure uh, many analysts found mainly three reasons one thing was nokia's technology was inferior to apple's but they failed to acknowledge that and uh, they had a lack of vision that is they didn't realize that people started moving from uh, moving to smartphones right so that is the reason why if if they had a proper analytics team which can kind of figure out hey we are losing the market we should do something in order to bring it back right unfortunately that hasn't happened right? so that is the reason why we say always data science is a critical part of uh, any company right and th these are usually we call it as the five p's of data science where you have a set of people with a uh, working on a particular purpose right because the most important thing in data science is the problem or the particular a particular uh, question which you are facing right so all uh, all these questions should lead to products where the focus is really uh, is on the question or purpose that are defined uh, by your by any big data strategy right so uh, ultimately you do some process on a platform so that's why i was saying programmable programmability is actually a very significant thing over here right and uh, how to achieve these things right and also what are the various uh, opportunities available in in these uh, data science uh, domain right so you have a very very breadth of analytical skill base right and usually one of the significant uh, or, or from a UG level, one of the significant opportunities out there in data science is one is data engineers and the other one is data uh, scientists, right? So usually we I tell an example, data engineers are the plumbers building a data pipeline, while data scientists are the painters and storytellers giving meaning to an otherwise static entity, right? So uh, usually you would have heard of this old uh, Hadoop, Spark or Snowflake, Scala, Right. So these kind of uh, frameworks, they are actually managed by data engineers. So there are, uh, it's actually very rare to find people who have both the skills together, but uh, that is also, I'm not saying it is impossible to find such person. There are persons who are uh, good with data engineering as well as uh, data science, uh, as a data scientist, right? So, uh, so data engineers are usually curious, uh, skilled problem solvers who love both the data and also at the same time, they love to build things that are useful for others. So in either way, data engineers together with data scientists uh, and business analysts are a part of team effort that transform this raw data in many ways that provide uh, the enterprise with a, with, a, with a thick competitive edge, right? So, uh, so, so ultimately, uh, leveraging big data is no longer nice to have. It's a kind of must-have option. So, uh, both skills, uh, the the skill sets of a data engineer and a data scientist, both are critical for a for a company to function as a team, right? So, uh, and also, uh, if you if you think about the various frameworks that are available over here, you, as I mentioned, you have R, Python, 
and nowadays you have the upcoming julia programming language right so and also visualization also plays a significant a part in in the field of data science right? so as such if you think about uh, uh, data science how exactly uh, the pipeline in data science works similar to or or if you are thinking about software university to build a software you have certain steps like you have different models right so in a similar way for data science projects also you have a proper pipeline so where you have a planning phase where you'll be defining the goals you will be organizing the resources you will identify who is good in uh, doing this and also you will schedule a project plan right and then one of the most significant uh, portion is data preparation or getting the data pulling the data cleaning the data uh, refining and exploring the data so all this is done in in phase two right and it's also interesting to note that uh, maybe 80 percentage of our data science project is actually spent in this planning and data preparation maybe the other things can be done in the uh, in 20 percentage time right so usually when you say uh, you create a model we can assume that it is a kind of function it's a kind of magic function where you give the input and it will actually uh, gives uh, gives you the required output or it uh, whether it is prediction or classification or or any sort of regression right so ultimately you will create the model you may validate the model you will evaluate the model and you keep on refining the model and uh, also there should be a lot of follow-up so uh, when you're talking about deploying a particular model in a real use case or in in a production level following up is really really important because sometimes you know the kind of uh, model which you have created uh, and the kind of data right now you are you are encountering that can be completely different you call that as data drift right so then you may have to again rewire your model to make sure that even uh, that spectrum of the data is also covered right so in the follow up you you present the model you deploy the model you revisit it and you uh, archive whatever data or whatever model that are significant so that you can reuse it even in a later stage so modeling as such is a process as i said it's a cyclic process you have an idea you identify what exactly uh, is that a uh, particular problem you are facing then you design a model you train it with 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 the data right and then you keep evaluating you test the model whether it whatever we have made is good or bad right then you start interpreting and if you feel uh, this model is fine you can stop it there but else it's always an iterative process right so uh, with that i think we can take one more quick break for just one minute okay so uh, we have seen about uh, what exactly is the process of uh, data science right and uh, usually there is there is a lot of expectation among uh, among the student community and also uh, there is a lot of hype with respect to data science and ai right because now actually uh, everybody wants to do something in ai and data science because maybe most of them knows that uh, that is the hottest topic right now in, in the technological domain, right? So usually what I've found is, especially with respect to UG students, uh, they'll come to me and say, uh, sir, I want to do a project in data science. And uh, say so most of the time, they may not be uh, knowing what exactly they are doing. Or in other words, they'll com simply come up with a data set and say, I want to work with this data set, right? So 
one of the significant things in working in data science project is always we should be uh, asking questions so asking questions in the sense uh, you should have that uh, habit of asking questions so then only you'll be able to uh, come up with a, with a good analysis right so and in addition to that let's say that uh, if a, if a student has done some a model using a, say a random forest right so uh, uh, once you create a model how do you know that whatever you have done is good and uh, how do you make sure that i cannot improve it further right so whether do i should i try another model so uh, how exactly can i explain these uh, results right so the capacity of data scientists to uh, explain uh, how their model function uh, is becoming more and more crucial because anybody can just drag and drop some code and get some results but to explain why something is happening that requires real uh, stuff and that requires a lot of knowledge right so data scientists have a responsibility to assist people in making them understand how this is working and also uh, to make use of uh, all of its benefits if you know something well then obviously you will be able to make uh, most out of it right so data scientists must be uh, competent enough to code but they must also uh, articulate and explain uh, their findings so if you can't explain what you did it doesn't matter how skilled you are at coding so that is that's why earlier in that uh, drew conway diagram also i was mentioning about uh, the communication skill you should be able to communicate what exactly uh, you you got right so one such thing is say for example uh this kind of say if if you are uh you got you may get something values like r square or p value or mean square or these kind of things right so you should be able to comprehend and explain what exactly is meant by those things and how exactly that is that is playing a significant part in your model right so uh how to do this and uh which particular framework should i follow that is a very tough question in today's ai and data science world this is a data and ai landscape with respect to various verticals like infrastructure uh, analytics and machine intelligence uh, enterprise applications uh, and open source tools which are uh, avail available right there right so it's impossible for a one human being to learn all of this but what i would suggest is at least uh, if you can learn two or three uh, things out of these things that itself will help in uh, getting a career a good career in in data science right so i'm not going to uh, much into this right now so till this time we were talking about data science and of course without ai uh, it it doesn't um, uh, make this data science complete right so ai obviously makes the machines learn fast and basically make decision on uh, our behalf that is a very uh, simple explanation of artificial intelligence so uh, although the concept of ai has been around for centuries it wasn't until the early 1950s where uh, uh, alan turing explored the possibility and he came up with a paper in uh, like with the concept like whether machines can think right so ai is now becoming the universal engine of execution so uh, as digital technology increasingly shapes all of what we do and enables a rapidly growing number of tasks and processes uh, so ai is also becoming the new operational foundation of business right so as we enter the age of ai the emergence of digital operating models is actually transforming uh, this this competition among companies as well so uh, maybe many many people might be thinking once ai comes you, you there might be a lot of people might be losing their jobs but i would like to uh, counter it with with another argument say consider the case of photography more than 100 years ago the invention of photography had a kind of disruptive impact of of the uh, technology of painting that is artist paint art painting artist uh, and uh, they had uh, a great effect by reducing the demand for such works or most of the painters they had a feeling that now they lose their job they will not have anything right so painters had trouble responding to this this kind of a threat from photography but eventually they changed their approaches and inventing new styles and techniques so the important point here is that film based photography threatened old norms 
and created new opportunities. So the same thing is going to happen with both AI and data science. It is going to create a lot of new uh, opportunities, but it will be threatening definitely the old normal things, right? So this is the evolution of uh, AI. So as I mentioned earlier, deep learning or neural networks uh, was there right from the 70s, but uh, it is uh, especially if you think about deep learning uh, right now, only we have the enough, uh, say, physical resources to actually run such kind of a uh, network right now, right? So, and also another thing I want to um, uh, focus here is the most of the time the AI part in uh, in any of the AI solution could be just five percentage. So even with that five percent, you can uh, create a lot of change. So, for example, suppose I want to make a drone driven detection of crop infection here i don't know anything about how a crop is infected or how uh, how to identify whether something is infected or not right so i, I need to rely on some agricultural scientists and uh, their knowledge will contribute to 95 percent of the solution accordingly only the ai solution will be uh, kind of generated right and this is how you uh, differentiate between uh, programming and machine learning where in programming you give the rules and data and it will give you the answers while in machine learning in order to find patterns you give data and the answers and it itself finds the pattern so that's how you uh, find solution to a, most of the ai problems right and one wonderful thing is that whatever this computation uh, a supercomputer or these machines are doing that is that cannot be compared with our human brain and also if you're comparing the the power consumption of human brain it is hardly 20 watt while if you compare the power consumption of all these supercomputers it is almost equivalent to a substation right so this is a kind of man versus machine chronicle and uh, how exactly uh, we can uh, how exactly this is making man a superior one right uh, uh, with a uh, reduced or with a low energy consumption how it is doing all these wonderful tasks so, uh, so basically, one thing is that uh, uh, machines will be able to perform well as long as there is no ambiguity in that particular problem. So the moment we have ambiguity, it becomes extremely difficult to write a problem or write a write a program. So uh, uh, that is, uh, for example, in in professional life also, uh, professions which have a lot of ambiguity in that profession they will earn a lot right for example if you think about lawyers and chartered accountants they are the two professions which encashes because of the ambiguity same thing can be interpreted in different ways right so uh, because of these multiple interpretations and inferences uh, there is a lot of possibility so human can do this kind of ambiguous things in a much easier way but when it comes to a machine it actually uh, it won't perform as good as a human in that cases so why is it that because what distinguishes an algorithm that runs on a computer from an algorithm that you run, right? So uh, a human being may be able to tolerate uh, when an algorithm is imprecisely uh, described. Uh, that is, if I'm saying uh, the traffic is bad in this particular route, you take the alternate route, right? So then uh, uh, my brain will think, okay, bad means like it is in this scenario. I'll have a sense of, of a sense of how a bad traffic looks like. Right? But the same if you tell a computer, you need to clearly define what exactly is a bad traffic, how it is, what are the parameters which can say that this is a bad traffic and this is not. Right. So all these things, brain does it in 20 watt. And I can say that brain is an approximating machine. So one more thing I'll just show you. So for example, if somebody is asking you, uh, can you compute 923 divided by 21? and tell whether it is greater than 1.75. So uh, without even completing the calculation, you will be able to say, uh, yes, it is true because you would have done it in your, uh, you would have done a mental maths in your brain and thought that 21 multiplied by two is 42. And here I have 92, which means that definitely it is uh, the, the first part is definitely greater than one. So immediately I can say yes, right? Now, if I give another uh, question, say, is 923 greater than 21 and whether it is greater than 45 you need to do some amount of computation to just to make sure that uh, you will just see 21 multiplied by 4 is okay 84 so 
it's a little more amount is a little more time is required to calculate this thing but if i'm asking you what exactly is the answer for 923 divided by 21 then you need to calculate the whole thing right so in the first two cases your brain was quite fast and it can easily do this approximate computing right so but uh, in the case of computer they are not good in approximate computing of course there are technologies and techniques which can do that but it as of now it hasn't matched with a uh, human brain one more thing i'll show you you would have seen this as a whatsapp forward or something right so uh, this is also another ex uh, example where the uh, it shows the significance of uh, approximate computing all these letters are kind of jumbled and only the first and last uh, last alphabet is actually in place but still we are able to read it because of the approximate computing capability of our brain right so how do you uh, how do you apply this uh, this ability or this particular approximate ability on to your data science projects or on to your ai projects right that is uh, really the challenge and you should have the ability to apply so for example if somebody is learning chess you will learn uh, how each can be moved and finally you combine the moves of all these uh, all, all these all these coins in the chess then obviously you will be able to play right a combination of all these things will make you a better chess player so ultimately it's it's all with the analytical abilities right that is you should be uh, if you want to uh, improve your analytical abilities then obviously uh, in data science there are two options one is uh, engage in uh, internships so maybe in your summer vacation or winter vacation try to get in touch with a startup or with a good company and apply there and be with them for at least one month or so understand how they are working right so that will uh, definitely change the perception or the perspective of how you look at problems and how you solve problems the second thing is you interact with more people who are working in that domain you see today sky is the limit for this kind of interaction because you have all these wonderful social networking platforms such as linkedin or facebook or in all these things you have uh, specific groups where you can find like minded people around the world right and obviously the the, the next thing is uh, you should uh, read think and apply in these domain read more about these things obviously that will enhance your your knowledge and also finally you should learn to work in teams as i said data science is not a something which you can do it alone it's always a teamwork and also try to work on case studies case studies in the sense real problems which uh, which companies have faced and try to uh, read about how they have solved it in a, in such a scenario and try to reapply that in a in a local scenario or in a, in another problem right so these are the ways in which we can improve uh, analytical abilities I'll, I'll just rush it up and i'll i'll show you some uh, use cases where uh, how you can think uh, and uh, how you can uh, bring that bring that thought process on to uh, any of the data science or ai problems right for example always we say necessity is the mother of invention right so i'm just showing you one one picture uh, and this is actually an example of uh, a board which was installed by robert bosch in bangalore city and this actually shows the next bus to uh, bangalore international airport in in how many minutes you have the next bus right so they have installed it in some bus stops in bangalore which will uh, show this in real time also similar to the one you see in metro like when the next train arrives so to this kind of a system what else can be added uh, just to improve and just to uh, uh, kind of make people's life easier so all you want to do is uh, just think what you will think if you are standing at a bus stop right so usually one thing which you might be thinking is whether will i be able to get inside the bus or not right so whether it can be crowded or not the next bus is in nine minutes can someone tell me whether it is crowded or not right and uh, let's assume uh, another thing say let's assume i got into the bus i want to know whether i'll have a seat in bus or not right so uh, obviously this kind of uh, thought process that is artificial intelligence plus our imagination or artificial intelligence frameworks plus our imagination can work real wonders in creating useful application for the uh, for the society so uh, so data scientists will need to work hard 
every day to learn new abilities and be adaptable in their uh, approach to their profession so uh, so ultimately successful data scientists require advanced uh, technical skills which which change regularly so you don't have a uh, the, the same technology as we are using three four years back right so also i need to give a warning here data scientists who refuses to try new things will fall behind those willing to take on the challenge of try something new so uh, so it's a something a field where you need to uh, update yourself constantly right so this is another use case where say mobility sharing and traffic management uh, so uh, usually uh, why people tend to own private cars one of the reason is public transport systems are never perfect and it cannot meet all the people's needs right so when you uh, decide to drive a car in a congested area you pay for the fuel the wear and tear and the time you lose on the road due to congestion so uh, ultimately you can create more congestion and increase the time loss for other drivers so to eliminate such a market failure maybe uh, we should have some kind of mobility sharing and traffic management systems right so i'm just giving you some hints where you can take it up and work as a mini project or a project where uh, that will help you a lot in in pursuing a career in in data science so ultimately the challenge is actually uh, a lot of challenges are there you need to drive them all together uh, for getting a success in in the real world project and and also the ma massive size and complexity of these problems are also one of the reason why you you have a lot of requirement or a lot of manpower is required in this particular a domain right so so if you are uh, if you are uh, thinking about the various ai business categories so most of the time we make use of these uh, machine learning algorithms which works on large uh, data sets to make predictions and recommendation like say predictive modeling or something like that right and uh, say if you are thinking about uh, any any risk analytics right so usually these are the different ai verticals or different ai uh, business categories uh, which are a kind where most of the companies are working so it is not limited to this but the most significant one i'm just showing it here so if you are interested to uh, work uh, in any of these things uh, what you can do is uh, try to uh, read about it and also try to uh, uh, code a little bit on this particular domain and then like uh, you can explore and make yourself uh, uh, kind of uh, competent in, in in any of these areas right so i'm not uh, uh, going much into the depths of these things so ultimately the bottom line is uh, you need to learn principles and techniques so that like you can excel in in this in this domain so as a as an ending note i'll also like to show you some more data where in the last one year we observe a uh, lot of patents have been uh, filed in the domain of uh, AI and data science, especially uh, from uh, fr from the Indian context. So, majority of the AI patents originated in India and followed by followed by US. US had only 24 percentage of the of the number of patents. So, obviously, this itself is a showing a great shift in in technology. And also, uh, as a developing country, we also have a lot of significance in contributing to this particular. Uh, AI, uh, uh, I mean AI uh, platform, right? So uh, with that, uh, I just mentioned few things where uh, I have been working on uh, in the last few years. So uh, one thing which I have been uh, working was on uh, 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 with Microsoft, especially the Microsoft AI for Earth project. So here, what we have done is we have uh, done a detection and classification of diseases in in rice crops, and we had tied up with an agricultural uh, say society, and they were the one who uh, gave us the required domain knowledge and also the uh, the required data set. And uh, another thing is, especially the coconut ripeness detection using uh, computer vision. This was funded by a company called Orzico, which was based in uh, USA. And the other one is actually uh, based on forest inventory, where you actually take a picture of uh, a spherical image of, of a portion of the forest, and here you'll be able to measure what is the uh, width of each particular tree, and using that, you will be able to calculate how much forest inventory is there in a particular region. Right? So that's a very challenging project, which we are doing along with uh, University of New Brunswick, Canada. And, uh, this is another one which is known as AI Fora, 
which is artificial intelligence for social assessment which is done uh, in collaboration with around five countries and it is being funded by Volkswagen uh, Foundation and this is one of the very significant project which can tell how the uh, artificial intelligence is going to affect the society assets so uh, uh, i'm the principal investigator of this particular project and this is an ongoing project and it's a very interesting one so with that uh, let me thank each and every one of you who have uh, listened patiently for uh, this much time and if you have any questions i'll be uh, happy to take that Students, please ask questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your lively session. So now I call upon Kanti to be a little please. So, on behalf of IT department, it gives, it gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the welcome thanks for this event uh, to all the participants uh, who assembled here. So, I would like to thank the today's business person, Chief Guest, uh, who honored to do this lecture event. And, uh, um, spare time from his video shooting to bring the session. So, uh, thank you, sir. So, I uh, thank you all the participants, faculty, and HOD madam. So, thank you, sir, for being with us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, today, sir. Thank <laughs> you.